Okay, uh, my name is Pat Hanran, and it's my pleasure to introduce Gordon Westing. So my area of research is computer graphics, and two areas of EE that I'm particularly interested in is imagers and displays. If there weren't imagers and displays, I wouldn't have anything else to do. I'm mostly a software person. So Gordon works in this area, in particular in computational imaging. Uh, he came to Stanford in 2014 and runs the computational imaging lab, as well as being the co-director of the uh, Stanford Center on Image Systems Engineering. Uh, he's won numerous awards, NSF Career Award, Presidential PCAS Award, and actually just last year, in 2018, he won the Significant uh, New Researcher Award. And that work was on uh, VR display technology, uh, uh, 3D display technology, and rendering algorithms associated with that. And what's really great about Gordon's work is not only does it have sort of consumer applications like VR displays, but lots of interesting scientific applications as well. So I think he's going to tell us about both today. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the introduction. And uh, it's really been a privilege to be here at Stanford working with outstanding students, uh, postdocs, faculty colleagues, and also the wonderful staff members for the last five years. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what's going on in the department right now, uh, but I'll make a few historical references. So many of you probably know these images that Edward Muybridge took about 20 years before the department was founded. And back in the day, Stanford wasn't actually a university. It was still a, a farm where horses were bred. And Leland Stanford had this bet with some of his colleagues whether there was ever any time uh, where the horse had all four hooves in the air at the same time. It apparently was unknown at the time. And he commissioned the experimental photographer Edward Muybridge to develop the first high-speed camera system uh, that basically consisted of a number of wires that were spun across this track. And as the horse was running along the track, it would release these mechanical shutters in front of these cameras. And high-speed photographs were taken to prove Leland Stanford's bet. So arguably, imaging is one of the oldest disciplines here at Stanford, even preceding our uh, department. And we continue the tradition, but uh, with a modern approach. Uh, so our lab basically works at this intersection between digital signal processing, optimization, and machine learning uh, on the one side, and then optics and, uh, on the other side. And that includes geometric optics and wave optics. So we work on many different topics, as uh, Pat alluded to. And I, I want to tell you a few things, starting with, uh, with some interesting new developments that really bring the hardware and the software together. So this was uh, one of the topics that we've heard a lot about, this convergence of hardware and software. Um, so let me start with a motivating example. Uh, I showed you Edward Muybridge's photos that were captured at a few frames per second. Uh, today, camera technology is so fast that we can actually capture uh, light in flight. Uh, we can build cameras that can uh, record at the speed of light. And here's an example where we have a laser on the one side that is coupled into an optical fiber. So some of the photons will scatter out of the fiber towards the camera as the light uh, propagates. And we can shoot these laser pulses at some repetition rate into the fiber, and we can actually record how they propagate in this medium uh, and basically build a camera that captures at a, at a trillion, almost a trillion frames per second. So now this is captured over the course of a minute. It's a repetitive event. But it's really remarkable uh, how far we've come with this technology. So this is recorded with what's known as a single photon avalanche diode. Uh, these are really modern uh, photo detectors that can not, that are not only sensitive to individual photons, but that can also timestamp the, the time of arrival at uh, picosecond accuracy. And some of my colleagues here, including Jim Harris, are actually working on the devices. Uh, others, like Mark Horowitz, are working on the, on the integrated circuits, timestamping these. Uh, so you basically get a photon event, you timestamp its arrival, uh, you build up these histograms with the time of arrival uh, of different photo, uh, uh, photo electro events. And what we work on is uh, uh, modern signal processing optimization to process this data, because typically it's very noisy, and uh, also there's a lot of missing data. So how could this be useful in practice? So this was a motivating example, but there's no real practical use of uh, looking at events at this rate. Well, one, one example is to do 3D imaging. So if you send a short laser pulse into the scene and timestamp the time of flight of this pulse, uh, you can measure the distance of the object and you can scan that over the scene. So this is commonly used for applications, for example, in autonomous driving. So these LiDAR systems that you see on, on these autonomous cars, for example, on top or on the sides, all the Waymo cars that are driving around in the area now, they actually help the car see 
their environment in 3D. So they will capture these point clouds by scanning the environment, and that helps the car to make robust decisions and map, helps us map the environment in 3D. Okay, so we work a little bit on LiDAR, but uh, one of the topics that we're more interested in is actually enabling entirely new imaging capabilities. And one of those would be this idea of uh, looking around corners. So if there's an occluder between the imaging system and the object of interest, I mean, there's no way of really recording the light returning from the object because simply there's no light going there. However, we may be able to use indirect reflections of light that bounce off of directly visible surfaces and that scatter behind the occluder, interact with the object there, come back to the visible wall, and then all the way to the camera. So let me illustrate that with a, with a short video clip. So we have, here we have a laser uh, that emits a pulse of light. We will record the time of flight. Some of the light bounces back directly to the system, but some of the light also bounces around the corner, then back to the visible wall, and then all the way back to the detector. And if we timestamp this as here with a few, nanosecond, a few nanoseconds, we can kind of estimate how far away, of course, the visible wall is. We got the direct pulse that told us, okay, the direct wall is uh, uh, at uh, 2.7 nanoseconds, so that's about 40 centimeters. Uh, but we also have this indirect light bounce, right? That's the third bounce, the, the light that bounced off of the directly visible wall into the hidden part of the scene, back to the visible part, and then to the detector. And that came in a little bit later, and that time difference tells us that there's something there behind the wall uh, at about 24 centimeters away from the wall, but we don't know where it is. We don't have any geometric information of that. So it's actually incredible that we can measure anything at all uh, because the amount of indirectly scattered photons is orders of magnitude lower than the directly reflected light. So that's maybe one over R to the six if you, if you look at the distance. Okay, so now we're gonna scan the system over the wall to get these indirect light bounces uh, with their time resolvedness uh, and then try to develop inverse methods around that to resolve the shape of the object. And it looks kind of like this transient image that I showed you of the optical fiber earlier, but here we're really only interested in the indirect light. So for example, if you measure an object that is hidden away from the camera that looks kind of like this mannequin, you may record light transport that looks like this. So these are actual measurements from the lab, uh, individual photon counts resolved over time, uh, and then we built these inverse methods around it to resolve the 3D shape of the object. Uh, so these are actual measurements that was published uh, at Nature last year, and the idea was really on this co-design of a scanning procedure that would enable a closed-form solution for this large-scale inverse method. So we developed a transform that allowed us to formulate this inverse problem uh, as a shift invariant 3D convolution, and there's a closed-form solution for that, which is basically Wiener deconvolution. So it sounds very simple, but getting to that point is actually uh, uh, took, took us a little while. So we've been continuing to improve the hardware setups, getting more powerful lasers, scanning outdoor scenes and ambient light. You can see that here. Uh, on the right, you see what the camera sees, which is just the wall. We're just scanning the wall. Uh, on the left, you can see that the hidden part of the scene contains the statue and a plant. Uh, now, if we put a camera behind, behind the corner, um, we can actually see how the system is scanning the wall, but we can also see these indirect reflections on the statue and on the flower pot. So these indirect reflected uh, light paths, this is what we're interested in. Then again, what we record is actually light propagating in free space, but this again is the indirectly reflected light. Uh, here you can actually see the wall, which is uh, because you have a lot of ambient photons that come in at any time. Uh, and we develop again robust inverse methods to resolve the shape of the object here uh, seen for this particular scene. Now, as I was saying, like, we've been working a lot with geometric optics models and you know, uh, inverse methods for that. Uh, we've more recently looked at uh, using wave-based models, for example, the time-dependent wave equation, and we realized that this whole inverse problem is actually closely related to what people have been doing for a long time in seismic imaging and other fields. Uh, and in particular, this non-line-of-sight imaging problem can be formulated as a boundary value problem where you measure one boundary value, which is the time-dependent signal at x, y, z equals zero, because you just measure this signal at the wall, uh, but with the time, time information. And then we, we use a fast uh, propagation me method, a range migration method, that gives us also in real time, again, this other boundary condition, which uh, is then the 3D shape of the object. So here's another example where we have a room-sized scene. There's an Ikea shelf, a couple of books, a disco ball, uh, and a few other objects with 
very different reflectance uh, properties. And this is the hidden part of the scene, so the imaging system doesn't see this directly. We again sample the wall and measure light transport that looks kind of like this. You can't really make out what's there. Uh, it looks kind of beautiful, and it's all spotted in this case. And I'll show you in a second what that means. Uh, but this light transport, if we play it back slowly, basically comprises uh, the dragon, which is kind of glossy, these speckly parts, those, these are actually the reflected light from the disco ball, the facets. They all come in at different times on the wall because we have such high time resolution, we can resolve these path length differences. And then here's the statue, which is more of a diffuse object. So it's really beautiful to see, difficult to interpret. But using inverse methods, we can now reveal the shape of this hidden object. And this is really remarkable because we can build imaging systems that don't just see in 3D, directly visible objects, but they can see around corners. And applications to which we apply this now is actually making it harder and harder to see also through densely scattering media, for example. Uh, so here's an example where we don't just want to see around a wall, but we may want to see through a, a scattering media, in this case, a, a scattering diffuser. Uh, and uh, my student actually just captured this data earlier this week. Uh, here again, we get this time-resolved information, and typically we don't see anything. I think somebody talked about uh, the ability to see through fog. I think Tom Lee, was, uh, that, that was you, uh, talking about these uh, klystrons that could see through fog. I mean, imagine we could do things like that with the LiDAR by just changing the firmware on, on the system, so that's kind of the idea behind this. And with conventional methods that don't really have any intelligence built in, like, like gated imaging, in this case time gating, we can't really resolve the shapes. But using clever inverse methods, we can resolve that there are two characters here, uh, one U and one T, and that's some preliminary data that hints at some of these methods also being applicable of seeing through fog and other densely scattering media. Okay, I think as a department, uh, we see a lot of interest in AI and machine learning out there. Uh, so most of that is actually happening in, in, in CS these days. So as an EE department, we have to ask ourselves how we can uh, build on top of these new developments. And uh, one of the ideas that our lab in particular is working on is thinking about how we can build you know, optical computers or specifically optical inference machines. So in computer vision, what you do is you have a loss function that you use with massive amounts of training data to optimize the weights and other parameters of a neural network. So you backpropagate an error into these algorithms. What we can do as well is optimize the physical parameters of a system. So by using a differentiable simulator of the whole system, we can propagate the error not only back into the software parts and the parameters of the network, but equally all the way into the physical parameters. In our case, that amounts to, for example, optimizing the shape of the lens. So a question you may ask is, if you wanted to build a domain-specific camera and its only job in the world is to classify cats, you know, what would that camera look like and could it be different than a general purpose camera? So you can think about such a device as comprising a physical layer and a digital layer that are jointly trained in simulation, and we then fabricate a custom lens that does parts of the computation in optics or in physics without any memory requirement at, at the speed of light. So you can interpret this as an optical encoder electronic decoder system where the sensor is the bottleneck, or you can think about this as a hybrid optical electronic neural network that may excel at certain uh, inference tasks. And we explored such tasks, for example, to do things like image classification. Uh, in simulation, we then get an optimized optical element. Here we can see this diffractive optical element, very small. You can drop it into the lens of a camera. And when you record an image with this camera, uh, it will create multiple different copies of the input image, as you can see here in the captured data. And each of these copies is convolved with an optimized blur kernel. Typically, blur is something that's bad in your camera image, but in this case, we actually have the blur kernels optimized, so it implements a convolutional neural network, or more specifically, one layer of a convolutional neural network. Now, as you may know, implementing optical nonlinearities is very difficult, uh, so right now, this is a two-layer network where one, net, one layer runs in optics and one layer runs in, uh, in, in the computer. Uh, so that allows us to get twice the classification accuracy for the same power budget, or half the power for the same classification accuracy. All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit about AR VR and how this co-design of optics and signal processing can help make better displays and 
uh, immersive virtual reality systems. So also before the, the foundation of this department, uh, Charles Wheatstone invented the stereoscope. We already heard a little bit about stereo vision in one of the earlier talks. Uh, and what you'll notice is that even though there are many consumer devices in this space right now, the basic principle of operation is still the same as the original stereoscope. It hasn't really changed all that much. And enhancing virtual reality is actually one of the NAE grand challenges right now. So one particular aspect that we've been interested in is this idea of uh, bringing focus cues into these VR headsets. So let me try to explain what that is. It, it, a conventional VR display just has a, a planar screen, like your phone, and a lens. It's literally just a magnifying lens. It creates a virtual magnified image at a fixed distance. So you're basically looking at two planes floating in space. And that's not a, a natural way of looking at the world because the world around us lives in 3D. We accommodate or focus our eyes at all these different distances. And if that's not the case, which is the case in VR or any 3D display today, uh, there's a thing called the virgin's accommodation mismatch, which creates nausea uh, and many other problems. So there have been a lot of developments in the space of trying to address this problem. And we've been working on many different technologies. My students are prototyping displays in the lab with 3D printers and new kinds of optics and algorithms. And I just want to tell you about one of these ideas, which is very simple, uh, which is called a very focal display. So here we can mechanically move the micro display inside the head mount by just a few millimeters. And if we exactly know where the user is looking at and how far away that object should be, we can dynamically adjust the physical distance of this micro display uh, to the lens and drive the focal plane of the display adaptively to the region that they're fixating. Uh, we built some early prototypes in 2016 by just mounting a couple of stepper motors on, on these existing headsets. Uh, and that wasn't all that interesting. Our PNAS paper was actually about a large-scale user study that we conducted with about 175 people using this benchtop setup that is a lot more precise and that has means to actually measure where people accommodate. And what we found is that for young people, we can create much more natural viewing conditions using this very focal display mode than what is currently possible. And so we collaborated a lot with industry. Our friends at Facebook uh, last year put it in one of their prototypes and announced it publicly. Uh, this is the half dome prototype that's still in development. It's not a product yet, but they're basically putting this eye tracking system into the headsets, and it's probably something that we'll see coming out as a product uh, very soon. So that's really exciting. And what it, again, what this solves is it allows you to accommodate in VR over a range of distances, trying to mimic these natural responses of the human visual system that we experience on a daily basis. You can also correct for nearsightedness and farsightedness, but one thing that uh, it cannot do is, uh, is really correct for presbyopic vision. So as we age, our range of accommodation actually shrinks, and we can't really accommodate to any distance anymore other than one. And this is something that's going to hit all of us uh, after a certain age, maybe around 45 or so. And actually, Benjamin Franklin invented a really great solution for this, which was, he called bifocals. It's, it's two different focal planes integrated in the same lens. And you look down, you can read, and you look up, and you can see far. The challenge with that is that the field of vision for each of these distances is severely reduced. And so that really hinders task performance. So what we thought is like we have all these cool components like eye tracking and dynamically focusing lenses and all these things. Uh, can we maybe take these technology components and help people see better in the real world uh, rather than just in VR? And so we built this prototype that we called autofocals, and it looks pretty big and clunky right now, but there are actually ways to miniaturize it. Uh, this includes a stereoscopic eye tracker. In this case, we have a depth camera also that looks at the world and captures a 3D depth map of the scene. We have these very, very focal optics that allow us to dynamically change the focal power of the lens, uh, and a couple other components that allow us to dial in your prescription. And we, again, ran a large-scale user study. Actually, some of you may have participated in the study. Uh, that we just published earlier this year, where we demonstrated that the task performance achieved with this prototype in particular is better that, than the progressive glasses that people typically wear, and it, it gives you better visual acuity over depth range than monovision or other um, prescription correction methods. So what I'm saying is that using these, you know, the, using the co-design of algorithms, in this case eye tracking and the control mechanism, with these emerging focus tunable optics uh, and lenses, uh, we can build eyeglasses that may give you better vision in the future uh, than current prescription techniques. So why is it better? Well, it's gaze-driven. You just look at something, automatically comes into focus. We triangulate the distance to what you're looking at and drive the lenses to exactly that distance. 
Okay, so these were a couple of interesting research projects. I'm all, I also develop a course on virtual reality where the students build a head-mounted display from scratch and they learn all about the computer graphics, the programming uh, and tracking. They work with Arduinos and, and many other things. So it's been a ton of fun to uh, teach this course for the last four years. So with this, I'd like to end it and say happy anniversary, double E. It's been a pleasure to be part of the department. Thanks. Yeah, that's definitely a big question, right? Can we use this imaging through diffusive media for medical imaging? Um, the thing is the temporal resolution right now is a little bit limited to maybe you know, a few tens of picoseconds. Um, and hopefully you'll bring that down by order of magnitude <laughs> over the next few years. Um, but that only gives us about centimeter scale resolution. And so yes, we can build on a lot of inverse methods and algorithms that people in the OCT community and other communities have been developed. But this is mostly applicable to larger scale things in you know, computer vision, autonomous driving, things like that, because a centimeter scale resolution is good enough there, but it's not good enough for seeing anything useful in the body. Like a yeah, or less, yeah. A would be pretty good. Yeah, okay, so th there's your challenge for developing better <laughs> spats. When you were doing the um, uh, scanning and, and reflecting off the wall and coming back, how many, how many scans do you do and how long does it take to, to gather the data for? Yeah, so right now we scan 32 by 32 or 64 by 64 or even up to 512 by 512 points. So that defines the lateral resolution of the hidden scene. Um, we can actually scan pretty fast. We have a couple of real-time demos where we scanned at maybe 32 by 32 points uh, and actually reconstruct in real time too. Um, I think the limiting factor is actually the SNR at the end of the day, the signal to noise ratio, because we get so few photons actually coming, scattering back that, you know, the devices aren't sensitive enough right now. They're single photon sensitive, but the quantum efficiency isn't all that great. So we have to repeat the experiment many times. And we can do these real time experiments for objects that are retro reflective right now. So objects that are hidden, but that, uh, you know, scatter most of the light back to where it came from. So we had a student dress up in a retroreflective tracksuit and we can perfectly reconstruct him. But, you know, doing this with a black shirt, for example, or dark clothes, that's a lot harder because a lot less light will be scattered back, yeah. So in, the, in this experiment, actually, I saw your equation is related to like the variables of X, Y, Z, and T. How about the wall itself? Do you have to have a perfect wall like a mirror? Yeah, so how do we get the wall, right? So we assume that we know where the wall is because we can directly scan it. We're, the, what we're actually measuring is the direct reflections and that gives us the shape of the directly visible surface and we have the indirect reflections that gives us some information of the hidden scene. So the direct surface, we can just recover directly from, the, from these direct reflections and they're already in the data and then I removed them digitally from what I showed you. Um, but yeah, that's a very good question. Speckle, yeah. So speckle is definitely a big challenge as you get the temporal resolution down. So right now, we don't see any speckle because it's just averaged out. Because again, like the temporal resolution that we have is you know, order of magnitude or more longer than the wavelength of light. So there, I'm sure there is a lot of speckle, but we don't see it because we average over much more uh, surface area and also in time. So. Uh, that's something that OCT deals with a lot, and I think eventually we're going to get there if Jim uh, does his homework. <laughs> but we're not, we're not, we don't see that yet. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much.